Hello, all. Welcome to the Ask, Ask the Experts panel at Octane 20. Um, thank you for joining and taking the time to listen. We wish we could have done this uh, in person as we did last year. That was a, a, a great success, um, but virtual is the new norm. Um, I would like to take you through quickly a safe harbor statement. Um, you guys can read and you've been through this before. Uh, no future promises for us. We're not giving direct contractual advice. We're, we're just sharing some opinions here. Um, you can read that or pause the video and read that as you will. Um, I'll start with introductions. Uh, my name is Kale Banks and I manage the professional services team here at Okta. And I'd like to jump right into introducing the panel themselves. Um, start with uh, Mr. Fend, Dave. Yeah, hi everyone, Dave Fend here. I'm a Principal Services Architect at Okta. I've been with Okta for just over four years now um, and working in the Identity and Access space for about 19 years. And I work remotely out of the Detroit, Michigan area. Joe? Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, this is Joe Raghunathan. I'm a Services Architect here with Okta. I've uh, been at Okta for about four years now. Uh, looking forward uh, to an interesting discussion on the panel. Larry? Yes, hey, good. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Larry York. I am the Services Engagement Manager for Strategic Accounts here in the East. Uh, I've been with Okta for about six plus years and uh, definitely looking forward to the conversation. Great. Thank you, Larry. I think we have some uh, some audio issues with Pragya. So um, Pragya is an architect also with uh, the professional services group. Um, we may or may not have to feather her in here as we move forward, but uh, let's jump right in. Um, we've taken, given the virtual um, medium here, we've taken the opportunity or the um, uh, to find some, some uh, question areas here that we'll touch through throughout the um, throughout this uh, session. Uh, I will jump right into the first question, which is directed to Joe. Um, what are the top three mm -hmm. things which can do to ensure a successful implementation? Sure, uh, thanks, Kiel. So um, it, it comes down to the basics, right? This is not new. We are not reinventing the wheel. It's the same things you see everywhere for a successful implementation. Key thing is the data. The data that you test with in your non-production environment, the data that you're using all along to come up with your test cases and other things has to mirror what you have in production. Um, we've oftentimes worked with clients who have assured us that, you know, yeah, this is, you know, this is a replica from production a few years back or whatever, but the data is so different. You go live and at that point you see all sorts of issues being caused due to data inconsistencies that we couldn't catch earlier. So definitely make sure you ha you're testing with the right data. Make sure it's production like data. You can mask any uh, you know, PII and stuff like that, but make sure you have your data right. That's the key. Uh, the second thing is do as far as possible, try and do your end to end deployment and testing in your preview environment, the Octa preview environment connected to non-production instances that you're working with. Uh, that is key, can't stress enough. On the Okta side, it's, you know, at least when it comes to app configuration and things like that, it's very simple. It's all, um, you know, that you can do very easily on the admin UI, but uh, let that not give us a false sense of security that it's going to work just like that in production. So let's make sure we do that end-to-end -end testing in preview. Uh, and for those implementations where you have a chance to do it staggered, right? Don't, don't use the big background, go staggered, Make sure everything works, and then be ready to move. Uh, you know, to push the entire population. So those are some of my thoughts there. Thanks, Kim. Sure, great. Thank you. Uh, great point. So um, data. Make sure real data, real fast. Uh, comprehensive testing, all blocking and tackling, but make sure we move that forward, and then um, not trying to eat that elephant uh, uh, in entirety, but just that a bite, a bite. Um, Bite at a time. So thank you, Joe. Uh, moving to the next question. Um, what are the most common pitfalls or mistakes you see that customers should try to avoid? Uh, Dave, I believe this one is for you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Gail. There are definitely uh, several that come to mind with that one immediately. But uh, first, I'll reemphasize Joe's comments when it comes to testing. 
you know, lack of test data and full end end environments for testing have uh, been at the root of many issues that uh, could have been caught and remedied prior to a go live. Uh, of course, there's load testing and planning for it and executing it. It's so important to really understand your usage patterns and attempt to properly simulate in the test environment before go live. Another mistake that uh, I see oftentimes has been kind of rushing in to set up your Okta agents. It's, uh, it's so easy to do so. And, um, you know, when customers realize that they, they like to get going, they like to take advantage of some of the ease of, of Octas, but uh, sometimes professional services will show up. And, uh, you know, after we start talking about best practices, the customer kind of quickly realizes they have to maybe reinstall and reconfigure and, and do unnecessary rework to, to get it going and following some best practices. Uh, lastly, uh, just simply making sure that you have Octa Master break the glass accounts, right? That uh, in case of something catastrophic that happens, that you have an easy way to get back in. Um, so you can kind of undo those changes and, and keep moving forward. So um, it's really just ready to be important for those worst case scenarios. Uh, back to you, Kel. Great. Thank you, Dave. Uh, very helpful. Uh, next question, uh, what advice can you give for enabling development teams or application owners to consider migrating to OAG? And I believe this one, Larry, is for you. Yeah, so I guess the first thing is if, if you think about it, the, the primary focus of most developers and uh, application owners are to deliver, um, you know, a product or a service. So, you know, one of the, one of the focuses that they don't have is to maintain a highly available, highly scalable, secure, fault-tolerant uh, identity platform. So, um, because quite frankly, it, it's, it's hard. It's a hard thing to do, but Octa does that pretty well and um, allows you to take advantage of our um, time and effort spent uh, and investment spent on, on implementing that platform. So, <clears throat> OAG uh, would give your developers and your application owners the ability to centralize a lot of those identities uh, so that you're consolidating, because most of the time applications that are on-prem could use uh, you know, a slew of directories or databases or something proprietary to the application. And um, this gives you the ability to kind of consolidate those and centralize those identities, giving you better visibility, as well as you know, centralizing your security policies. Um, so th that's good for the developers, it's good for the application owners. It's also uh, an ability, because it is a gateway, to give you the uh, access remotely. And especially in this day and age, right, we wanna make sure that our uh, employees can continue to work and access applications that are on-prem uh, from their homes or from their mobile devices. So the gateway gives you a, a great chance of doing that. And the great way is also uh, uh, the motivation behind a developer and an application owner to get everything behind a gateway like Octa OAG would be to uh, to create a smooth transition uh, to modernizing those applications. It's a good way to um, enable your teams to be able to go to a, a protocol like OIDC or OAuth or SAML uh, and you know do that over time, right? Um, and then from an IT operations perspective, you know obviously if you're thinking about replacing a WAM solution, you know, you're, you're allowing your uh, teams to uh, migrate away from the, the infrastructure that it takes to, to manage those solutions like you know, a CA or a Oracle Access Manager. Uh, and on top of that, when you, when you compile that on top of the platform itself, you're giving, your chance, you're giving yourself a chance to integrate with uh, thousands of pre-built connectors. And then also if your use case starts small, you're right, you're, you're able to grow from there given the additional capabilities and uh, features within um, the uh, Okta itself. And then from an enablement perspective, there's tons of great documentations that could help your, um, your developers, your app uh, owners to get up to speed of what Okta Access Gateway is. Uh, you can look on help.okta.com for that. And, and then um, there's also a brand new training class called Implement Okta Access Gateway that I'd highly encourage those those resources uh, take a look at. So that's uh, that's that's that would be the advice I'd give. Thank you, sir. Uh, Larry, the next question will will uh, be right with you as well. Um, how how will the new functionality of workflows influence lifecycle management? Yeah. Um, so a lot of our customers today are using Octus pre built integrations to manage. Uh, you know, the creation of users, the updating of users, the deactivations to the various third-party apps that we have uh, integrated with Octa. 
And what Workflows does is basically enhances that uh, that capability and uh, you know makes it a little bit more advanced in the sense that now you can actually do that joiner, mover, leader scenario uh, with uh, advanced flows and little to no code. Um, so the, the one thing, like an example would be if, uh, let's say that your user goes on a litigation hold and you need to be able to deactivate the user and move the contents of that user's mailbox to maybe the manager, right? You can do that with uh, workflows. And, um, you know, other, other than deprovisioning processes, uh, we also address things like uh, deprovisioning, uh, identity, um, identity conflict resolutions and being able to do things such as scheduling LCM tasks and reporting and maybe even reach out to various approval uh, type of um, tools like ServiceNow and such. Um, yeah, with, with, with workflows, uh, you'll help manage identities better uh, by automating those business processes. And like I said, it gives you a little bit more fine grain approach to the, you know how to uh, create separate um, integrations and schedule those integrations uh, and activities through our platform. And Okta Access Gateway are both, um, relatively speaking, new additions to the Okta family, but, but very exciting and a uh, tremendous amount of traction. So it's, uh, it's fun to see these take off. Um, next question, uh, what are some of the key integration benefits of the Okta Identity Engine? platform. Um, that, Joe, I think is over to you. Sure. Thanks, Kia. Um, so Okta Identity Platform is one of our uh, big launches at Octane this year. There's a lot of buzz around it, and it is something that everybody needs to get really excited about. So what we're seeing uh, is that increasingly our customers want slightly different behavior than what Okta Platform provides. And the complexity that we're seeing, just the sheer number of use cases is required us to make trade-offs in terms of you know, what we're gonna support while we build in new features. While this might satisfy uh, maybe 80% of our customers, there's always somebody who wants to do something different. So uh, that's where Okta decided to come up with this flexible identity platform. And that's the Okta identity engine. And what it does is it exposes the Okta platform as a set of building blocks that you can essentially mix and match to achieve those custom experiences that meet your specific use case. And you can truly think beyond what you do today. Um, the goal uh, ultimately is to allow uh, Okta to have an open platform and have customers and other third parties innovate and extend Okta. So the key features that uh, you can make immediate use of is the passwordless experience. That's the first one. I know that as an industry, we're moving towards you know doing away with passwords and OIE is definitely a step to get you in that direction. So uh, passwordless experience, for instance, new employees uh, joining your organization, give them a laptop and a YubiKey, and that's all they need to enroll and uh, start using your applications. For field employees who don't have corporate emails, again, the passwordless experience and how, how, how they're able to set themselves up is key. Uh, the next feature that you can make use of is progressive profiling, where uh, a lot of Siam use cases, people come onto your website. Uh, you don't want them to, you know, you don't want to force them to register right at that point. Uh, you want them as they go through the site, as they're exploring more and more features, you want to get a little more information about them. So progressive profiling is another key thing. Um, example is, you know, uh, you're browsing a supermarket site, you want to find uh, the discounts. At that point, you put in your zip code. But until the time you explore your discounts, you're not asked to provide any information. Uh, the final thing that a lot of uh, Okta customers have been asking for is per application branding. Right now, all branding, as you know, is at the tenant level. And we bring that down where you can change uh, the the, the branding per app. And by branding, I'm talking about uh, styling of HTML and CSS, the emails, the error messages, the domains uh, from where the emails go out, the sender. Um, and uh, each of these should now be customizable per application. Uh, thanks, Kim. There's lots more, but these are some of the key ones. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Very excited about the flexibility this brings to our customer base and uh, really feeds right into the, a lot of demand we've seen for that flexibility. Um, so thank you, Joe. Moving to the next question. What exactly is an Okta diagnostic and what are the outputs? And Dave, I think this one is uh, directed to you, correct? 
Yes, yes, thanks, Cal. Um, yeah, so the active diagnostic is a real nice, specially packaged um, two to four week engagement where um, you know the active professional services team will engage with you and do a full current state assessment review of your usage of Acta and provide as an output, a, you know, essentially a future state configuration and architecture recommendation. And we're going to do that based on best practices to ensure that our customers are getting the most value out of their Acta implementation and really trying to make sure that they're following recommended security guidelines. We find it extremely valuable for customers that may be implemented a little while back and uh, maybe possibly have, have experienced turnover uh, since uh, since they did their initial implementation and need a refresher, or maybe we're, they weren't even aware of the features that could be taken advantage of today. Um, with turnover, you know, essentially what we're hearing from customers is that uh, it may have been, it might be unclear to them today on how and why their act org was configured um, since maybe that person that originally did it has left and did the original setup so we can kind of help decipher that for them. Um, and with some of our older customers, we're, we're just finding that, that they're not taking advantage of all the features that have been added like uh, uh, MFA policies and factors or adaptive, um, something like password lists um, that Joe just mentioned, and uh, they didn't know they could take advantage of this, and they're just not getting the full value that we can unlock for them. So anyone that might be interested in this, the best person to contact would be your professional service engagement manager, like Larry, who will work with directly with you to understand your needs and put a package together for you. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you, Dave. Um, I think the, the key driver for us in pulling this together as a professional services team is exactly to Dave's point where um, you know, our, our platform, our, our cloud-based platform allows us to deliver functionality very quickly, but it's also hard for customers to consume um, functionality at that pace. So um, having some direction here to show you what you're missing is, uh, is very helpful for quite a few customers. Moving on to the next question. Uh, what are the difference between MFA, uh, multi-factor authentication, and adaptive MFA? Yeah, so adaptive MFA is really one of our uh, really cool newer features that we added about a year or two back. Um, that uh, the way I like to think of it, it really puts MFA on steroids. Uh, you know, with it, you can enhance your security posture while reducing user friction. And uh, when you think of traditional MFA, it's basically some pretty simple policies that are basically looking at trivial things like, hey, is the user on network or are they off network? Um, and uh, just making sure at the time they sign in, do they have to do MFA or not do MFA. With Adaptive, what we're able to do is we start looking at user behaviors. Um, and those behaviors, what we do is we watch patterns of logins over time for your users. And we're looking at signals um, for those behaviors and, and various signals, uh, such as device. Uh, have they logged in from this device in the past, or is this a new device? Um, have they logged in from this IP address before? Is this a new one? Have they logged in from a specific location? that you can define latitude, longitude uh, boundaries or city, state, country boundaries for you know, your definition of location, as well as velocity, which falls under that traditional Superman um, definition of, hey, I logged in uh, this morning at 8 o'clock from LA and a minute later I logged in um, you know, from New York and there's no possible way that any human could have moved that fast. So. Um, you can take those different definitions. You can look at how many past logins that you uh, want to be evaluated against and then combine those together to say that the, the combination of these different behaviors and, and what's currently happening on this login really turns into essentially a, um, a higher risk factor and that's when we want to uh, do an MFA as opposed to every time. And, and the fact that we're able to define that higher risk and prompt for MFA then is what um, kind of differentiate instead of just saying, hey, every login you require MFA, now it's you know just based on a, a higher risk profile. So um, finding really a lot of customers taking advantage of this and, and really, really liking it. Oh, that's great. It's, uh, it's rare that you get to see uh, higher security and a better uh, usability and user uh, experience combined. So exactly. that's yep. pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, next question, how can Okta assist my company in moving away from Active Directory? Uh, Joe, I believe this is over to you. Sure. Uh, so when you hear moving away from Active Directory, it, it's not an overnight thing, right? Uh, it's, it's more a long-term strategy, and you have to start thinking really where you want to see your um, you know, infrastructure, your identity infrastructure a few years down the line. 
So uh, we at professional services can come in and uh, review your uh, current landscape, the identity landscape, the AD dependencies, and advise you on you know how a cloud first strategy um, could be used, where you can leverage Okta to replace certain pieces that AD is doing today. Uh, so a couple of things that come to mind immediately are uh, you know the first thing is move selected users outside of your AD. Now, as the footprint of your organization is expanding, you see the need to interact with external parties like vendors and partners. Um, and where do you put them? Do you want to put them in your active directory? I think at this point, you can make a decision that no, let them stay in Okta UD. So uh, you can manage these identities in the cloud uh, with zero default access, easy to add and remove people, add group restrictions. So these don't go down to your AD, right? So all your external resources, you can make a decision to manage them in, in the cloud using Okta UD. Uh, so this also helps you kind of to consolidate and visualize all your resources in one place. So you can get your Okta master users, your AD master users, everybody you can see the entire organization and who all you're interacting with in one place in uh, on the Okta platform. Uh, the second thing that I can think of is move any, any application that supports modern authentication protocols like SAML or OIDC move them out, move them to the cloud, move them to Okta. Uh, the next thing is uh, making an HR system your source of truth. Uh, so HR to Okta and Okta down to AD. This way, Active Directory becomes downstream to your HR system, and this will minimize your dependence on AD. Uh, so that's another thing that you can do. Uh, another factor I can think of is, you know, um, adopt enterprise mobility management solutions like um, AirWatch or Mobileye to control access to devices across the enterprise and connect this to your identity and access management system. So having both these together, you'll be able to get user context as well as device context. And this adds that powerful layer of access management. Um, finally, uh, you know, come up with a roadmap. Decide at what point of time you're going to move uh, applications onto the cloud. Um, so these are some of the things that I could think of. We actually have a, an awesome white paper on the Okta site. It's called uh, Rethinking AD. And uh, I highly recommend that you guys go and take a look at that if you're thinking down this path. Thanks, Kia. Sure, you're more than welcome. Thank you, Joe. Um, moving to the last prepared question. What is the best approach to migrating existing users and their passwords to Okta without impacting their user experience? Uh, Larry, I believe the last one is for you. Oh yeah, fantastic. Um, so yeah, I mean, on this one, there, there's obviously several approaches, uh, and it more or less depends on kind of you know your business requirements, uh, various capabilities um, that you that you need to offer, uh, but then also kind of what your tolerance is for that impact, right? Um, every customer is different, uh, and usually in professional services, we would have to go through some type of discovery and design, and kind of really trying to get an understanding of what those tolerances are and what those requirements are. But uh, from, a, from a best approach, uh, specifically around the, the workforce, um, you know, most of the time you're talking about authenticating users that already exist in an Active Directory or an LDAP. And you know, with Okta, we have uh, pre-built connectors or uh, agents, if you will, that uh, allow you to utilize the credentials that already exist. Uh, so you can import those users at a frequency that you can determine. And you can do delegated authentication. So essentially not having to actually migrate the user's passwords, but still enabling them to authenticate through Okta and using the credentials that already exist in Active Directory. Uh, this is a good, quick approach and is supported out of the box with Okta. So most of the times for the workforce use case, that's, that's the easiest way and um, the best way to, to approach um, uh, bringing users in and migrate them to Okta. Now, from a SIAM point of view, so it's a little bit different. Um, and like kind of Joe was saying, there's most customers are looking to uh, get away from Active Directory for managing um, uh, user profiles. And so we'll see, as she mentioned, you know, Okta master accounts. Uh, and so, you know, it's a little bit trickier on how do you want to migrate those users? Because oftentimes there's uh, the need not just to move the profile over, but some of the credentials. And in, in some cases, you can preload Okta um, by you know a CSV import or using a you know our APIs. Uh, but you know if you've got passwords that are unencrypted, um, there's certainly we can set those passwords in Okta using the APIs.
but often the, the case is that uh, those passwords are encrypted using some type of hash. Uh, and so we'll need to you know, decrypt that and then set the set the user's password from there. Now, Okta does provide um, five hashes that we can support. Um, those are, if you're, if you're curious, those are decrypt, um, SHA-512, uh, SHA-256, SHA-1, and I believe MD5. Um, so those, those are some good options there. Um, now, if you don't have the ability, uh, if you don't have um, your hashes stored in one of those encryption uh, methods, then there are sequences that you can take advantage of. Um, and it's usually, we usually call that some type of live migration or some type of uh, live adoption of the user's password. Uh, and essentially what that is doing is during the authentication sequence, it's allowing some type of call out or hook to a service or a directory that will allow you to validate the user's credentials. And then upon a successful credential uh, uh, response, set the user's password in, in Okta, and then that way they would be migrated real time and as they've authenticated and validated their credentials. So that those are the uh, probably the least impactful approach, um, but not all customers can follow that simply because they don't meet the requirements of understanding where the users are, what their passwords look like, and we can't decrypt it. So the last resort I would say that most customers will take is that they um, they do a password reset campaign, um, which is fairly straightforward to do, a little bit more impactful for the end user, but as long as you're communicating and uh, enabling your end users in a, in a proper way, it, we find that it's not that intrusive. So um, yeah, that, that would be a, a few of the best approaches. Obviously, like I said earlier, it, it would probably take a little bit more deep dive into your scenario and your company's uh, requirements, but um, those were a couple of approaches. Uh, I think the, the core piece here is, as Larry started with, um, discovery and design to figure out what's best for you and what your tolerance is on user from a user experience perspective. But um, it's very helpful. Thank you, Larry. Uh, that's the last of our prepared questions. I wanted to absolutely thank everybody that uh, has taken the time to uh, participate or view this session. I also want to thank each of the panelists for making time here. If, uh, Got quite a busy schedule, but uh, I know they're excited about doing this one as well. So it's, um, I want to thank you all for that. Uh, two final things. Um, we have a support hub. So um, we prepared some questions that we thought were applicable to a broad audience, but there's certainly going to be some specific things that uh, you all will have. But this is an opportunity for you to be able to ask those questions. You can see the timing below. Uh, here on the slide itself. So please uh, participate in that and you can bring your own questions to the table. Um, finally, if you want to um, explore your path, wherever you are on that path to becoming an expert yourself, um, this is a, a description of some of our certifications, but we have a whole library of training classes, both on demand and structural ed and even private classes if, if and when you be. Um, you can see these people as well. You can see the expo floor hours out here at the bottom of the slide. So you want to uh, continue down your path to be an expert yourself. Um, this is one way to do it. So thank you again. Appreciate it. And uh, have a great day.